Hello and welcome to this episode of the Brighter Web Podcast. Insights on growing a small business using the latest technology and marketing best practices. As always, I'm Robert Carnes and joined by my co-host, Mickey Mellon. Hey, Mickey. Hey, good morning. Good morning. So this episode of the podcast, we're going to be talking about a unique subject that you quite a bit about, website accessibility. So you yep. excited to get dig into this subject? Yeah, it's, it's not an exciting subject, but it's a pretty important one, so it's certainly worth talking about. I'm trying to sell it here, Mickey. Get people excited about <laughs> website accessibility, because even if it's not as thrilling as some of the other episodes we've done, it's still really important. So why don't you start by giving us a definition of what we even mean by website accessibility? Sure. It's really pretty simple at its core. Executing is a little tougher. We'll get into that. But at its core, it's making sure that all users to your site can consume the content that you put out, even if they have disabilities. A uh, big one being vision impairment. There could be people that can't use a mouse and different ways to, to make sure that they're taken care of and they can access and read everything on your site. So it sounds like maybe people listening to this podcast may not know somebody who that applies to. It's, it seems like it's a smaller percentage of the population. So it could be something that's easily overlooked. It's, it's why we don't talk about this subject a whole lot, but why is it still worth pursuing even if it just applies to, oh, it's just those people over there, I don't really need to worry about them, but that's that's not really true. Correct. Well, for one, it's a bigger group than we think about. I mean, if you right. take all the different issues that people may have, it's about 10% of the population that either needs bigger fonts or, again, can't use a mouse or maybe can't use a keyboard or is completely blind. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good-sized chunk, but really it comes down to three big reasons why you may want to care about this. Um, one is a you sort of get a double win out of it where most things that you do for better accessibility are good for search engine optimization as well. If you do things to make your site accessible, Google also appreciates that, not because you're making it accessible, because you're making it easier to read and consume, and Google likes to be able to read and consume, and you'll tend to rank a little bit better if you do accessible proper things. The second one I don't like, but it's a big problem, is lawsuits. Um, lawsuits for lack of accessibility on websites is growing year after year after year, and doesn't seem to be slowing down. And Frankly, there's a lot of lawyers now that are finding this is an easy win. They can just shake down websites for a couple thousand dollars and because most websites, even if they try to do the right thing, have a few holes in there somewhere. So that's a problem. And can we pause right there for a second? Because sure. there's a lot of areas of frivolous lawsuits. And some of these lawsuits definitely are not frivolous. But like you said, it, it sometimes is a maybe not an ambulance chaser, but a website chaser who's trying to just get an easy win mm -hmm. and, exactly. and drum up some false legality. But I, I think one of the things we've talked about is, is sometimes there are enough loopholes where you can do all the things that you're supposed to and you can check off a bunch of boxes and still fall victim to some of these frivolous right. lawsuits. But <laughs> it's not always a frequent thing. Not, not that frequent, but again, growing in frequency. But you said like false attack, and really it's not false. I mean, most of these lawsuits are legit in that websites do have these issues. It's just that no one has really complained other than the lawyer trying to get money, but they're going to win in a lot of cases. And right. then, like you said, there are so many loopholes because there's not a specific law for this. People point to the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, but that doesn't apply to lawsuit or to websites directly, but it's brought in there. So when you're sued, it's, it's a big, messy thing. And again, lawyers know it's easier just to pay them a couple thousand dollars to go away than to get into that battle. Correct. And you know? I know there, there have been talks about other law laws that may help close some of those loopholes and make it actually better for both people Correct. who are building websites and people who need accessibility. There's one in early 2021 that did not pass, but it's going to keep coming up to just put some parameters around this so we all know what to expect. But really, if you just do some of the basic accessibility things that can point to that, that'll usually make the ambulance chasers, as it were, go to easier targets. Sure. You know? That's the idea. If you do the right things, they go, hey, they're, they're trying to do their best here. Let's go after a website that clearly isn't trying at all, and they'll have, it, have an easier time with right. that. Right. So. And, and that gets to your third point, which is just do the right thing. Right. Correct. I mean, you have the SEO angle, the lawsuit angle, but you also have these legit people that want to consume your content. Let's help them out and let them consume your content. Let's, let's do the right thing. So that's certainly the crux of this, but there's also the other more tangible benefits to it as well. Right, because it's a very different uh, experience. The, the internet is a very important and huge part of our lives, and it's hard to imagine what that would be like if you were somebody who, for example, was visually impaired and couldn't actually see a screen. So it, it's doing the right thing to help out somebody in that situation, yep, which, absolutely. like you pointed out before, is a much larger percent of the population than we would initially realize. Yep. So now that we've talked about why this is really important, why it's worth investing some time and energy into website accessibility, where do we get started? Sure. So good question. There's a, a lot of different places to go, but I'll just go through some of the basic things you should look for on your own website. The first place we'll start is actually something not to do is there's 
a thing called accessibility overlays, where you add this plug into your site and it'll make it accessible, and it really doesn't. I won't get into the details too much, but there are a lot of people that have disabilities that say these, these overlays make things worse. You can actually go to the website, should I use an accessibility overlay.com, which is a big long name and it's almost tongue in cheek, but they actually have a lot of great resources on there about why you shouldn't use those and why you should actually go and properly build out your site to facilitate use from everyone. And, and spoiler alert, when you go to should I use an accessibility overlay.com, the very immediate answer is no, you, you <laughs> right. should not. But yeah. I, I like that they are also giving a lot more resources of of alternatives of things that you should be doing. Yep. The next one is just finding the right theme, and this applies to WordPress more than others, but if you have a theme that's just loaded with junk, like a lot of themes are, and they advertise it, they don't say it as junk, but they say, we have 10,000 features baked into our theme to make it easy, that's gonna make it difficult for you to make your site fully accessible. Not that it can't be done, but you get into trouble there. And we've talked about that before, we'll talk about it again, where I always believe themes with WordPress should be dumb and pretty. You should find a theme that just is clean and works well, and then add plugins, to add the pieces you need for functionality, which makes it easier to fix any little issues that come up with accessibility. So if you have a big bloated theme, you're gonna have a hard time, I think. And I think that's a, a microcosm of this entire subject is it's a, just a different way of looking at building a website because normally when you get a theme and they've got 10,000 features, you're like, sure, why not? I right. may not use them, <laughs> but it, it can't hurt anything, right? But when you look through it with this lens, it, it lends you a different perspective and it really says, no, 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 those things actually could hurt your website performance and could hurt uh, a certain percentage of users' experience with your website. Exactly. And those things could hurt your security of your site and the sure. speed of your site and other things too. So it's, that's a whole topic for another day. <laughs> yes. But yes, bloated themes are a problem. Uh, the next one is alt text. So the alt text on images that you put behind it, which is intended for this very purpose. So if a user can't see the image, it'll tell them what it is. This also plays very heavily into SEO. Google looks at that alt text to see what the image is about as well. Um, and really your alt text, it's a popular place to try to stuff keywords, but I urge you not to fall into that too much and really just accurately describe what the image is. So if someone can't see the image, you can say, oh, it's a woman standing in the field holding a red ball or whatever the image is, just give an accurate description. And then related to that, and this goes back to just general good web practices, if you have pictures of pictures and text of text, don't bury text in a picture, don't try to do cute things there. If you have text on the site, put text on the site. And a decade ago, that got kind of tricky because you couldn't use the right kind of fonts you needed sometimes and you couldn't put text properly over an image, bury it in an image. These days, that's not really an excuse. You can do whatever you want. So if you can have raw text on the site and style it to look beautiful, of course, but then people with screen readers can read that raw text versus just having to deal with the alt text from an image. Yeah, and this is a great example, like you said before, of doing the right thing and setting it up properly will really help your SEO because search engines like Google are really looking for those best practices when it comes exactly. to website accessibility. Yeah, yeah, so much of this ties together to that. Now the next one doesn't affect SEO, positive or negative at all, and it's one people push back on, but it's very common on websites to have links open in new tabs automatically. When someone clicks to go to your Facebook page, it opens in a new tab, and that's really not a good thing for accessibility because you're gonna mess up those users and perhaps break their keyboard shortcuts and things like that. And really the only reason people ever do have things open in new tabs automatically is kind of selfish. It's kind of saying, I want to keep people on my site. And my thought is if people like your site, they'll come back to it anyhow. And a lot of users know how to open links and new tabs if they choose to. This one isn't a big deal, but it's again, something to keep in mind. And really, if you are going to open links in new tabs, you can put a little icon. There's a pretty well-respected icon with an arrow you know, pointing to the upper right that indicates this link's about to take you in a new tab that lets people know before they click what's gonna happen there. I, I never like websites that do that to me, even just from a functionality standpoint, right. it's, it's kind of frustrating. So <laughs> I, I think it's a good best practice to do regardless. Yep, and it is an accessibility thing in some ways. Like I know people that if you open a new tab, then they try to click the back button, which of course no longer works because it's a separate tab. And they'll say, ah, forget it all and just close it all down because you broke their back button. Sure. So letting just standard web browser features work is a good thing and opening a new tab kind of breaks that a little bit. So um, not a big deal there. The next one is form fields. If you have a form on your site, making sure the fields are just properly labeled. There's lots of cutesy ways to put little soft text behind it that no one can really read and things like that. Just having, frankly, obnoxious labels on your form fields makes it very easy for users to know what needs to go in there. So that's a pretty easy one. Absolutely. Uh, the next one is having an accessibility statement on your site. You can 
put one in the footer. You can go to our site uh, at greenmelonmedia.com. We have an accessibility statement you're welcome to steal and use on your own. This is one of those things I think is just to help keep the lawyers at bay a little bit as much as anything. I don't think many people are going to go read it, but if a lawyer comes to your site saying, I'm going to find someone to sue today, and they see you have an accessibility statement, you'll say, ah, these guys are at least thinking about accessibility. Let me go find an easier target. So that's my thought there. But again, it's just doing things to make sure you're in the right place and taking the time to do that statement will make you think what you're putting in the statement, making sure you have it on the site too. So it's kind of a win-win all the way around. So it sounds like that's a just a pretty low bar to clear in order to, again, <laughs> right. like you say, avoid some of the, the nastier kind of stuff of website accessibility. And, and like right. you're saying, a lot of it can just be boilerplate stuff that you're copying and pasting right. from a generic statement like ours. Correct. Because an accessibility statement doesn't really make your site more accessible. It's just, yeah, <laughs> just to make it appear that way, which is a value. Correct. You know, unfortunately, it, it does help. Um, and then the last one is an interesting one. I'm a big proponent of using camel case hashtags on social media. So using a capital letter for each new word in a hashtag just to make it so a screen reader will read it. If it's all one word, if you had the word camel case hashtags all lowercase, it would read it like camel case hashtags, trying to do it as some big ugly word. And so having it that way makes it easier for all users to see. I see that a lot where I see a hashtag I'm like, what are they trying to say there? I have to sit back and parse all the letters. And so having the uppercase letters mixed in for the start of each new word in a hashtag is, again, good for all users and particularly good for those with screen readers. We've all seen, if, if you've been on social media long enough, people trying to basically say an entire sentence mm -hmm. in lowercase <laughs> words right. that's like 100 characters long. And those are sometimes being very tongue-in-cheek. But right. like you're saying, it's hard for everybody to read those. So if you're actually trying to reach people with shorter hashtags, uh, capitalize the beginning of every word, right? right? And that'll be an easy thing. Absolutely. So that's, that's a few good steps to get started there. So Okay. So we covered about seven steps, the seven things that people can do. And, and some of those are fairly easy, but some of them are a little bit more technical. So what's like one simple starting place for somebody who's like, okay, I, I really, I don't know much about website accessibility, but you've convinced me I'm ready to uh, actually add this to my website. Mickey, what's a, like a helpful tool or website that somebody could go to to get that process started? So, I mean, first just go through the things we talked about. You can look at a lot of this on your own on the site and, and correct some of that. The, the favorite tool I have that will actually scan your site and look for problems is the WAVE tool at WebAIM. So the website is wave.webaim.org. Um, they have a tool you type in your website address and it'll, it'll find whatever issues it has. It'll look at things like alt text. It'll look at contrast. We didn't get into that. And there's a lot, you can go a whole lot deeper in this subject, but having proper contrast on your text versus the background will go in there and Wave will look at that. So yeah, wave.webaim.org is a good place to start. Uh, and obviously we will add all of these uh, notes and links to the tools in our show notes on the website, uh, abrighterweb.org. Uh, or dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Okay. All right. I know the website <laughs> real well. So, and, and of course, if you need uh, other help, uh, website accessibility is something that we also offer uh, on all the websites that we build here at Green Melon, our marketing agency. So if you have been, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Brighter Web Podcast, brought to you by Green Melon, a digital marketing agency. Uh, to help your business keep up with the latest digital marketing trends, check us out at greenmelon.com. You can also find show notes for this episode and more episodes of the podcast at abroaderweb.com.